Today I have for you a couple crystal, glass crystal clarinet mouthpieces, and I'm going to analyze them and compare them and then reface one of them, a full reface. Over the years I've done mm, just a handful of these, you know, five or ten, and some have been adjustments and not full refaces or repair chips or whatever, but this is a rare opportunity. A client sent me two of these, and I've never done a glass... Uh, mouthpiece refacing video. So this is it. So one is a Selmer. You see, this is a pretty common, you know, HS double star clarion. It's written in script with a um, engraver on there. The other one is marked Blamen, and it doesn't have any other size markings on it. Construction is similar. They're almost definitely from the exact same factory, because you can see in terms of the general flute shape, the interior and, you know, the um, metal cap on the end, you know, it's the same thing. But there are some variations. So they weren't made, like, the same day or week or whatever. I guess they could be, but different molds. Um, one of the observations I uh, came up with a little later is the flutes are actually slightly different. Um, so this has, you know, there's three flutes on the side of the uh, Selmer, and the other one has three flutes, but the middle one is divided, and there's like this rib. So a different outside mold was used. And it doesn't seem to have changed dimensions very much, but, um, you know, maybe it, maybe it did, and I just can't pick up on it. Uh, and they did something like that to tell the mold apart from others. So it's the same on both sides. Now, there, this is made um, with two side molds, the best I can tell, and uh, the way I tell is um, uh, you can't see a seam down the middle because they cl clean that up. But you can see in the shank, there's a little seam there uh, on both of them. And when you flip them over, you can see a seam here and there. And the rest, they kind of polish down so you don't see it. So the two halves uh, come straight out. So these flutes, even though they look like they'd be radially out from the core, um, they're actually made so that horizontally they can pull the mold straight out and, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll draft properly for these flutes, three on each side. Okay, uh, and the cores are similar because I've taken um, some measurements down on, on the baffle um, and they, they, I'll show you, they compare pretty well. They're, uh, the cores go in, there's two that go in from the t uh, two ends, and they meet in the middle right around here at the throat, because that's where the design changes from a straight sidewall to a, uh, you know, cylindrical backboard, um, you know, with a slight taper on it. Okay, uh, what else can I look at on here? Um, you know, the, um, the left rail on this one, which is the Blayman, is a little shorter than the right rail. The tip kind of tilts, tip rail, and kind of tilts this way so that this end is a little shorter than that end. But um, the summer looks better. There's a bunch of little microchips on there over the life of and use of them. Uh, I, to really see them, you, know, you have to go in with some type of magnification. At least I do. What else can I comment on these? Um, all right, we'll start getting into the analysis. So I brought up my combo fit spreadsheet that I use for clarinet. Get the lighting so that you can see this. This is the blame in first. So what I have here is the facing curve with the mouthpiece in this orientation. So what you're looking at here is the curve, and this is a tip opening exaggerated, which I deal mostly in inches. Um, so I measured the tip on the inside at 048 inches, and that converts to 1.21, 1.22 almost millimeters. So it's considered kind of a little more open than a lot of hard rubber pieces are. Facing length is 37 on one side, 37.7 on the other. So, um, 
and it's crooked in, in different spots. Now, the blue line is my actual feeler gauges and glass gauge measurements. And uh, when I get into refacing, I'll, uh, facing it, I'll probably show you how that works more. The, um, it is crooked in a couple spots. So, you know, putting the gauge on here and lining it up, I have two spots that are very crooked and they're opposite each other. That's like the worst case. Uh, so my third feeler in, the 10, it's right here, it's 23 and 22 is what I had. So when I drop that in there, it leans to the right. Whoop. One, two, three, 23 and 22. Yeah. Okay. Leans to the left. Okay. So it's 23 on the left, 22 on the right. And then two feelers down, it's the opposite way. On my 26 feeler, I get like 11 on the left and 11.8 on the right. So, you know, if one whole rail is lower than the other, you can get a read to kind of play on that. But if you've got, you know, the seesaw back and forth crookedness, that's really bad. And the other thing I measured is the second feeler gauge uh, creates a bump here. And I noticed that after you do the curve fit. Now, I have two kinds of curve fits on here that are built into this spreadsheet. Um, for sax mouthpieces, and maybe about half the clarinet mouthpieces I measure, the elliptical fit fits best. So um, I have that in here. And then the other fit I use is a power fit. And I explain this more on a YouTube, other YouTube videos, the difference between these two. I, have a, I think I have a, a video on my co how to use my combo spreadsheet, and I go through a lot of the curve fits. Um, so right down here, the way you can tell which one fits better is by the sum of the differences under the column. So for this particular mouthpiece, before I even working on it, it looks like the power fit is a little better than the elliptical fit. Often they're both very similar. Um, let's see what else. Um, so that's the Blayman. Now if I go over to the Selmer, quite a bit more even. There's no bump. Now, I can't tell you that all Selmers are better than Blayman's. This is just one example of each, and it's probably the first Blayman I've seen. I've seen Pomerico, you know, O'Brien. Um, so this is only a little crooked, you know, and the facing is much shorter. It's at a 30 for the smallest feeler gauge, and this is similar to the facing they put on hard rubber uh, mouthpieces that are HS, HS star, HS double star. They all have this shorter facing length. I went through my records to tell that. Then it's a little crooked near the, near the tip. So on this one, um, the client actually prefers the longer facing length that I've used on some other mouthpieces I did for him. So I'm thinking, of, you know, we're going to be making it longer. So the target curve that he likes, I copied from um, a different job I did for him. And if I put, put this in, the fit changes. That's what he prefers, a longer curve. And if I do that on the Blayman, it doesn't move that much. It, it took a little off here and actually became um, a little shorter. So the now I'm, the target curve is actually in the power I didn't update the elliptical area, just the power area. So the target for the uh, mouthpiece would, to meet, would be to make this one facing a little shorter at 35 or so, and the tip opening be similar. Um, the other one, the Selmer, it's also a 35, and um, the tip opening would actually looks like it's a little more closed, um, but a longer facing, so you have to take out a lot of a lot of material off of that facing. So I'm going to do the Blayman first on this video and, and do the Selmer off video. Um, what else I can show you? The, this is a plot of the baffles. I use my dial gauge to measure the baffle profile 
the tip opening on down. So I take measurements at different distances away from the tip opening, and this is the shape of the baffle with the mouthpiece in this orientation. So in this case, your tip opening goes up from there, and then the baffle, you can see a little rollover I measured in the HS star, but the blamen is flatter there. And I don't know if that's by design or chance, but then the rest of the shape has this concave kind of a look to it and slight differences. But, it, you know, it's it, within reason, they're both made with the same kind of core, you know. Whoops. Bouncing this around. Um, so uh, that reminds me, I may switch this uh, video over to a tripod so on the floor so that uh, when I work on the mouthpiece, it doesn't shake so much. So I'll do that. So the, one of the things I will do first is to clean the baffle. And I use a little bit of vinegar on that. My stash is getting a little low here. But, you know, it's kind of cloudy in there and makes it a little harder to see whether, it, you know, there's, there's scratches or anything inside there. So clean a little vinegar on there. And it gets off the uh, calcium deposits on both of them. And I didn't mention the tables on these, but actually one of them is concave and one is convex. And actually it's the Selmer that's convex. So even though the Selmer is probably a uh, better playing but more resistant mouthpiece, the uh, it's got a low spot across here. Uh, so the straight edge kind of rocks very slightly. You know, if you clamp your ligature with more pressure here, you'll be okay. And then the, um, the Blayman has a little high spot at the end here. So um, I'll show that more as I flatten the table. It'll, it'll become apparent. Okay, I've switched to tripod. It's kind of far away, but we'll start like this. Anyhow, the... Um, I cleaned these up with vinegar and I didn't pull the patch off, but this is, uh, the Blayman has some sanding marks inside. And I don't know if that was done by an owner during its life or if it was new that way. The Selmer seems smoother. Um, I don't think it altered it a whole lot, just some light sanding. Now my work surface, I'm gonna get ready to start refacing. Uh, I have a whole video on this work surface that I came up with that I like. Um, this is not cheap, but I I like uh, Mylar back um, sandpaper that with that's adhesive, and I put it on a glass plate. I put a um, two different grits that I bought. Uh, you can get these from Tools for Woodworking. They're not they're not cheap though. I like you know I buy a batch at a time, and you just have to spend a couple hundred bucks on them. Uh, <coughs> anyhow, two grits I get are. 40 uh, micron and 15 microns. It's in a different scale than most sandpapers. And I printed this out years ago, <laughs> back in 2009, um, making sense of sandpaper. And there is a uh, equivalent that, um, even in the grit scale, there's two different grits. Uh, <coughs> the U.S. scale and the P scale, and both are sold in the U.S. Uh, and they differ mostly in the finer grits. But anyhow... Um, the 15 micron is a fine sandpaper, which could be 600 or 1200, depending on which scale you're comparing it to. And the 40 grit is coarser. It's either 280, 360, uh, depending on what you're comparing it to. So, um, so that's what I have on these uh, two, uh, that area. Then I have a full glass plate that I put an entire, uh, you know, sheet of the coarser on there and this has been used a little bit but still has some grit to it so i'm going to start flattening the table with this one so let me bring up the blame in and i'm going to do is turn off i'm going to keep the target curve in there and i'm going to turn off the elliptical since the target is is from a, a power fit um it has a, a power of about 1.8 and, and 
and um, you know, it still goes through like close to 48, it might be a little more closed, and a facing length of uh, 35. Yeah, it is more closed. So, um, I really, I guess, need to go back for the client. Luckily, it's not too far back. And get a target for the tip opening that that fit is for. It's more of a 47. That's what we had for that curve. All right? So, and a thin tip rail. So, that's, that's really where we're heading with this one. Okay, I'll remind myself by putting 0.047 right above that. I'll put target. Okay, this is the target for the where we're heading. All right, and now, like I started to say, I'm going to close off the uh, one of the um, uh, get rid of the, uh, from the chart. I'm going to turn off the elliptical fit. Just gets in the way. So there, it is more easily, you can see where we're heading and where we're at. Um, all right, here's the blaming. So we're going to start, being how I know there's a high heel, I sometimes start backwards. And um, let me move this to make sure we're looking at my sheet. I'm going to start actually backwards so I can put my finger on the heel, apply a little pressure there, because that's very interesting. You notice right away, you know, I, I said it was a high spot at the heel, but actually it was here. It's cleaning up here and here. So I'm going to, most of the time I go heel first. All right, so we've already gotten a, we haven't touched anything in the middle yet. Since um, the facing's too long on this, so I really do need to take material off of this area. Low spot in the middle is kind of nagging because it's it's hanging on there. I don't see a lot of light coming through, so maybe we'll get there. Now you see my hand technique. I do put a, a extra pressure right here. And I am looking at whether or not I need to bias a little more to the left or the right to clean up this table. down about a quarter of an inch or less. Yeah, with fresher sandpaper, it might have gone quicker. That's down about an eighth of an inch. Okay. 
starting to clean up around the edges. It would play fine probably leaving the rest of that there, but we're this close. full reface without going the all the way. All right, we're almost there. I see like a few little things. I may just switch to a, a finer sandpaper to see if it cleans up the rest. Okay, we'll put that away. Go to my other sh sheet here. Now this is fresh. Now it's a little dirty, but. Okay, it's all cleaned up. Now the other test of how flat you are, you can try looking with straight edges. It's kind of tough to see on glass, but when you put your glass gauge on there, which is pretty flat, and you hold it with your hand, do you feel, get a sense that it's on a flat surface? Or as you hold it, It'll spin if you've got a high spot that's significant enough in there. I don't feel anything. But um, if I did feel something, I'd, I would try. You, see, you might just have to go back to flattening. But try taking sandpaper and just trying to belly it out a little bit. And maybe you'll, you'll make it flat enough to work on. That might take, <laughs> take 15 minutes of sanding, though. Okay, how uh, much progress did we make on the facing length? Let's take the... 15,000 feeler, which I've been using upside down since it's old enough that the other edge, I think, it has been worn a little. You drop this in, and it goes down to, what do you know, it goes down to about 30, which is uh, quite a change. You know, I only needed to uh, you know, take it down to 35, but that's what it took to get it flat. Um, what else would that help? Near the tip, um, my target is more around 1.2 now with, with the uh, 49 gauge, and it doesn't go in there anymore. So we've closed the tip opening down enough, which is good because as we open it up, the tip rail will get a little thicker and give us some extra real estate. It gets thicker from the inside, um, and then we will be able to shape the tip to match, you know, a reed profile better. It's not that bad now when you look at it with this template, but without the template, you can see that this side is shorter than that side. Um, so what I'm going to do, since I know I have a lump, well, let me move, move this up. Since I know we have a lump in the facing curve in this area here, I'm going to put a little mark and rough it in a little bit. So we're somewhere around 25. I use a Sharpie for that on glass. Sometimes I use a Sharpie. You can also use a white paint, paint marker. I use that more often than the Sharpie, actually. So, now I'm gonna put that black mark, just give it a couple, a few strokes in that area, because we're so far away, I don't think we're gonna overshoot it. And if anything in that area, we might, uh, you know, it was crooked, so I might wanna lean to the, the side a little bit. And then further up, where it was crooked the other way. It's somewhere around 26. Let me see how it is, just a spot check. It's too close to tell, so I'm going to um, do a full set of readings, I guess. Maybe I'll open the tip slightly since I know that's under. Uh, 
right, let's, uh, maybe the facing's too long, so I'll do a little bit there. Okay, just a little, because I don't, like I said, I don't think I overshoot and shot it. I'll do a full set of readings. So, and I show this in a lot of my other videos. I go up to the, um, this area of my spreadsheet, and I put a formula in to make the right rail the same as the left rail data. And then I override that as I take measurements, but it gives me a starting point in case both rails are the same. I don't have to type in two numbers. So you line this, your gauge up left to right, and depending on what kind of gauge you have, you gotta zero it right outside the tip rail. Start with your fin feeler. And right now, I'm measuring, I call 31.9. And it's even. So there, I, the data went in. I'm using this um, remote keypad. Uh, it's made by Logitech, but it helps me type it in without having to reach across to the computer. I call that. 16? No, 26, I mean. Oddly enough, pretty even. Now 20.8. Now these three readings are coming even, making me wonder whether or not the table previously was rocking a little as I took my measurements. 15.9. That's good. It's less work if it's even, but a little disconcerting, <laughs> disconcerting that you know, it was, seemed to be off. It, well, I went back to it several times and double-checked those areas, so sometimes you get a little mystery. 37. 5.9. And what do you know? About a 1.1. And let's take measurement. So it ended up being... Um, 47 tip opening. Okay, this last reading is something that's probably not good to put a lot of faith in, that 1.1, because um, the whole tip opening using this gauge is 47. So in, in theory, uh, the 49 gauge shouldn't even go through um, or should only go down to somewhere less than what I just measured, 1.1. So what I'm going to do is uh, worry about that later by, um, uh, I guess while I'll keep taking measurements, I'm going to get rid of it temporarily from the graph because um, I think that might be more accurate. <laughs> and I'll just do it more by feel in this area. If, if it is accurate, having that gauge in there, I'll have to close the tip a little bit more, but um, I'll worry about that later. So, um, you can see that we have extra material to take off through all this area, but near the tip, we're a lot closer to um, the target. So at this point, I would, you know, rub off my, you can use either a solvent or whatever, a piece of cloth, get a, some new target points on the side of the mouthpiece. So we got to get to 35. We put a dot there and then take it off all the way up to about 10, maybe a little further. So I'm put, put a mark around 10. I know it's more towards the back. 
But the other thing I can start doing, um, early on in, re in the facing job, you can shape the tip from the outside. And I use, even on hard rubber metal or whatever, I use a combination of files, which you have to avoid using on glass. I have tried using them. If they're really fine, you can sometimes get away with a little bit of filing, but every now and then, a little piece will pop off, and that's not what you want. So this, um, like I said, this left rail looks short to me. So I'm going to sand from the middle out to the right rail to kind of make it more symmetric. And this is 240 grit. I only keep two grits, 240 and 500. You could, it's fair game to use something else to go a little quicker if you want. Let's see, I misplaced my oh, clarinet template. This is not easy to see against glass, so what you can do is you get a marker. You can use a regular reed. They just tend not to hold up. Put a little marker on the end of this. Nice thing about doing this early in the refacing is that it doesn't change the outside because it's perpendicular to the direction that you're sanding so the outside area will always kind of line up and so once you're done you're done with this part you may have to touch up the outside a little bit but that's a I think that's a lot better And we'll have to clean up on the inside and uh, bevel, bevel it a little bit. So. Okay, now I have got my other two marks for the facing work. Just doing like from the back mark up to halfway since that's where we got to take most of the material from. I can do about two thirds. The whole way between the two marks. And then you pick a point for progress. I'm going to pick this one that to measure around 20, so that's the 10 feeler. Now I'm using a lot more sizes than most clarinet refacers use. So that's 11.3. I mean, I get my numbers wrong because it's glass 21.3. So it was 20.8. And it's still a long way to go. Now that you know you're not making much progress, instead of doing three or so strokes, you can do like 10. That's good. Let me measure the next one. You see it jump right here. And we didn't overshoot. Next one I'm getting at 16, which is <laughs> interesting. No change. And if I go back, I get 20, 29.5, 29.4 maybe, 29.4. So that, 
gets all the way to there. And let's go with the long one. I get 40. So that's too far. <laughs> so that's definitely not what I wanted to do if that's real. Yeah. Now I have to flatten the table some more. Let me go ahead and put down past 16. We're at 26. Point seven, ten point nine. That's about the same. That's weird because you know, me. I don't know how that happened because I was not sanding past this mark, and now it seems like a low spot. <laughs> ah, sometimes. Thing, baffling things happen. But anyhow, let me sand down the 16 area some more. It's up near the, the front of my sanding range. And just in case there's a little funny, something funny on the table, I'll just sand that very lightly. So now let's take a full set of readings. Okay, go up here again, make the right equal to the left, copy it down. So, 15 feeler. I'm getting 40, 41. So uh, before I go any further, I'm going to flatten this table some more. So after about another 20 strokes, I got the table, you know, the facing length down to 35 again. Let's try this. Okay, zeroed up. First feeler. Thirty-five. Next one. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight point two. Three. Twenty-eight point three. Watch the graph move as I put things in. Fifteen, fifteen point one. Hmm. Is that real? Sometimes I get in there. So I got a spot there that's pretty fat. Ten. Seven point two. Come on, 5.2. Sometimes you look at the graph and it says, are you sure that's what you really wanted to put in? And I, you know, it's, okay, this 49 is, like I said, something we're not gonna pay much attention to. It might be a 0.8. Should be more like 18. So somewhere in that vicinity. Bigger blob. That's where I gotta take material off of. Now another thing you could resort to, I have a tool here I like to use. This is called a key stock, used by machinists. It's about a quarter inch by a quarter inch piece of metal. And I've taken some of this adhesive paper and covered all four sides. So to make sure that you're Get in the right spot. This is mostly useful for when you get near the end. You can, you know, mark your mouthpiece and actually kind of 
make sure you you get only what you're interested in. But um, that's going to take a lot of strokes, so I'm probably going to you know, do more work on this sandpaper instead. So let me reposition this. Now, last time I did this. That's tight. So, okay, where that mark is. A little bit on either side of it. That's my 17 feeler. Is 16 now. Went from 15 to 16. You can feel when you get glass dust, it's almost like metal dust, stainless steel dust, kind of gets, when you put your feeler gauge on it, you can feel a little grit under it if it's not clean. You see over the years, this is not a new gauge. It's all scratched up from a little bit of, uh, and sometimes it's sandpaper dust, but you know, when you put it on there, you can feel it under your thumb that it needs to be cleaned off a little, wiped off before you take a reading. That was facing with. So here's number 17, which has grown about 16.6. 16 16.8. So it's going a little crooked. I'll just call it 16.5 and 16.8. So I'll just do that one and lean a little bit more on the right. sand more off the right. Now what I'm going to switch to, I've got, and this is not fresh stuff either, two 400 sheets of sandpaper. So the left side I need some grit, and I use scissors to trim these as they get worn, but one up, one down near the tip, and even further back as it goes from 18 or so. Crooked from here on out. So I'm going to go back to 18, which is my 17 feeler. That's measuring 18 on both sides now. Okay, after some work off camera, I finally got the facing curve reasonably close to my target. It's a little longer, but I can, you know, take a couple strokes on the table and move it up or just leave it there. Now, you know, when I get close, I can actually um, recalculate the, change the target curve to see if 
it comes into a nice curve real close to it. So I have to change these three parameters with the solver. So it kind of brought in a little, little closer and changed it from a, instead of my target close to 1.8, it's more 1.9. So, um, you know, as long as it's a close, uh, you know, a good fit close to the target, that's usually a good place to stop. I, you know, I may, uh, well, what, I, what I'll show you to do is uh, I do, with, you know, when I got close, I was a little crooked in one spot, and I was having trouble. Um, let me zoom out down here. I was having trouble getting one side in without messing, getting one little point even without messing up the good points next to it. So I resorted to this, uh, you know, key stock with sandpaper on it and, and got the right spot. Now what I, uh, where I'm at, the, um, you look at the template. Template looks good, but the, um, Let's see if we can zoom in down here. Okay. What I have is the, the outside is still good, but the rails are a little fatter. And you can kind of see it's a little fatter than a reed. It kind of bulges out over here. Okay, so to even now, I'll even that up. Mostly that just helps with reed centering. It's not going to make it play much better, but you know, reed centering is important. The other is this tip rail is thicker here than in the middle, and it's a little thick over there. And then I got to decide if the inside looks good. The inside does look pretty good by eye. Uh, maybe it goes in a little bit over here. So first, though, before I get going, I, you know, when I get down to my final facing, I often eyeball it and look for little high spots. I don't really see any here, but if I do, I either use these wide sanding. Uh, paddles <laughs> or thinner ones that I have made up and get in there and take down the spots and, and smooth them out. So what I, since it looks pretty good, I'm just going to go with the fine paper, kind of lightly go over the facing. And this is actually trying to make the facing better than you can measure because it already looks good on the screen but you may have tiny little spots in between your feeler gauges that aren't quite uh, a smooth curve. And then when you get to the tip rail, you can kind of by feel, make sure that that's flat all the way across. And, and if anything, curls all the way to the tip, which I think is superior than flat. It's better for the altissimo range on clarinet and sax in my opinion. Okay. So normally I just go to a file and, <laughs> but you, you, your hands are tight, you can't use files. So what I do have are, uh, you know, I already showed you the, uh, the sticks. I can use these like files um, and you can get inside and do some sanding. You can even do, do some outside sanding. Don't want to get too far off the camera. The other thing you could do is wrap sandpaper around your metal files. Just hold it with your thumb and uh, see already that bulge looks at least visually a lot better. Yeah, you got to kind of angle it just right and then roll
roll into it, and it's going to scuff the glass, but you can go gradually to finer sandpaper, and then just like you do on hard rubber and other metal, and then gradually goes down to steel wool and polishing compound. So I'm seeing where it needs to keep going all the way up to the tip area. Look, got to use my coarser one. Now I could also use sanding sticks that I have here, but these are kind of, well, this one's got a flat surface on it. These are also usable, but sometimes they are, they're not as flat as the stick, but that's yeah, effective also. And I, I have a lot of these, so, you know, different, uh, different, some of them are repeats, but they have different ends on them. They're flat, curved, uh, and I use three different grits of sandpaper. So it, the, the side rails, as you get more towards the tip, flare out wider than the reed template. This is about a 200 grit, which is why I have a two on there, so 220. On these, I use like one, 120, 220, and 320. Now let's see, here's a 320 going inside. Now you can also use a Dremel with grinding points, but you have to do a lot of cleanup. You know, they leave gouges wherever you do it, but you know, we could thin that out that way. But it's, I use them on stainless steel some too, but you still have the same, the same problems, you got to do your finishing work on them. This is getting dull, but that's improving. I'm trying to angle this to make this corner square. It's kind of silly, but. Go back to something a little finer. But really, the main issue is the side rail overhang. Oh, that's a lot better. table down here is all it's okay table width is pretty good it might be a little thin in spots but I can't make it thicker very easily Okay, let's uh, 
call that good and move on. We just gotta finish up everything. So moving down to my ones. It's a one. Okay, we can switch from those. What else do I have? I have finer, finer sandpaper. So, I got my numbers backwards. I called that a one, but that's a three. So we go to three, you know, 300 grit. Get resourceful. You can use this inside. Maybe push it around a little, or like I said, wrap it around. Get yourself a file shape that you like. Wrap your sandpaper around it. And here's a tool you can use. baffle was sanded and scuffed up. I'm going to see if I can clean that up a little with my finest stick. Got to find it. Come on. It's a two. There he is. This is a little wider, so I just roll it Get it in there. Like I said, that's a 300 grit, and that's not going to make it shiny. I don't know if I'll be able to clean this, have the patience to buff that, but it could be done. And then you, you either have to get another, another tool with 400, Try this kind of a tight fit. Let's do something similar with six hundred.
I mean, I'm not gonna really worry that much about it. This is more cosmetic. Yeah, after doing all that, the next would be like steel wool. Take a lot of that, put it in here, then you push it around. Yeah, a little better, but it's not going to get clear. I'm going to do this and this. Same thing on the side. Use steel wool. To really, really clean it up, you'd have to probably work down to 1200 grit. This smooths out the scratches from this 600 grit sandpaper. Gives it kind of a blush finish. Or So the last thing we haven't done is the tip rail. And for that, I mostly use the sanding stick, I think. Try it with 200. Probably should have done this sooner, but you can do a, a few steps at it either first or last. Very lightly sanding the area between the center and the corner. Sometimes, again, I wrap, wrap some sandpaper around a file. Likewise on the right side. Okay, let's get a file. 300 grit piece. I actually rip it in half. Sometimes you end up with a tool that's, well, I wanted to use the round side anyhow. You can use a flat side if you need it or the round. I wanted something more narrow than that to get it more narrow than my sanding stick that I was using. Now here I'm almost using it like I would a file. Outside of the tip rail, and, you know, we got with the template earlier, and you're just trying to make a uniform thickness away from the outside to the inside. And but you have to actually kind of create a rolling surface and blend it in. You can't just chamfer it. the 
this around, actually, see if I can do that. Get the other side. thin area right here that I'm going to have to open the tip slightly to help thicken that up. And let me get it as uniform as I can before I do that. Uniformly thin, that is. Blend that all in. Okay, take a look. A lot better than it was, but like I said, it's kind of thin, thin in the middle. So I'm gonna get my sandpaper and feel kind of where the tip rail is. This only changes the tip opening slightly. Maybe a thousand of an inch. But it helps make the tip rail nice and uniform. That's gonna focus on. Yeah, it's getting pretty nice, isn't it? Okay, so essentially, uh, you know, we're done. Sometimes, you know, I try to mark it, <laughs> but it's glass, you know, scratching, you know, the numbers into the side of it. But I'll, uh, well, we're done dimensionally, cosmetically. Yeah, I, I would still work on it some. I stopped with steel wool. Um, you know, next I use some of this uh, polishing compound, which is a gritty substance, kind of like used on auto body work. It's like a paste with a grit to it. So it's finer than steel wool. This probably comes in various grades too, but a friend of mine gave me this. So you put that on the rag and go over this a little bit and it'll take out some of the steel wool scratches. And you can 
do this as long as you have the patience for it. I don't think I'm going to bother on the baffle because that's still scuffed from sandpaper. So that's a lot better. We, you know, we're, uh, might be a little scuffed from the interior surface, but the outside is, is per looking pretty good. That can be buffed. And you can go down to even a metal polish next and a buffing wheel if you want. All depends on how much, how much patience you have. So I uh, just wanted to show you not every single step, but a few of the tools that are different when working on glass. You see my final uh, tip measurement. There it is. Lost my, lost my depth gauge. This is, takes some practice to learn how to get the edge of this depth gauge right in the center of the tip rail and measure the inside of the, of, of. So there it is. Sometimes you can move it around with your left hand until you find it. That's 22, so that's 22 on top of 25. So that's 47, which is the target tip opening. And everything. The rest of the facing looks pretty good. Target. 